And so we'll uh, commit our time into the Lord's hands. eh? Father, we just once again want to thank you, Lord, for your presence here today. We want to thank you for your word. We thank you that we can spend this time, Lord, Lord, learning more of your plans and your purposes, Father. We want to commit our time into your hands. We open up our hearts, our minds, Lord. We say, speak to us, Lord. Give us that revelation. Give us that further understanding. Draw us closer to you, Lord. And we thank you once again for the power of your word, that it goes forth in the power of the Spirit and does not return to your void, and it achieves that which you're sending it to do, Lord. And so, Lord, we love you, we praise you, I submit myself, and lift up this congregation right now, and declare your blessing over us as we gather together and meet and discuss your word in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okie dokie. So... We got last week, we, were, um, we had been looking originally, of course, at understanding a little bit about the spiritual battle that we're in. The uh, Bible says not to be ignorant about these matters, and the Bible also says that, we're, that God's people perish because of lack of knowledge. Well, we, we want to provide knowledge. We want to provide understanding of what's actually happening. We live in a natural realm, but far more beyond that, there's a spirit realm. And we are spirit beings primarily. Yes, we have a body and we have a soul, but primarily we're spirit beings. And so we've got to understand a little bit about the spirit realm because that's where we operate. That's where the true battle is going on. We see battles on earth, sure, in the natural, all the time. But uh, there's a bigger battle going on in the spirit realm. And ultimately, it's a battle for the souls of men and women. It's talking about eternal destinies that we're talking about here. Eternal destinies, either a lifetime in heaven or a lifetime in hell. There's no third option. That's really what we've been looking at. So we, we looked at the first week about understanding the battle, the war that we're in. Uh, we then looked at, I guess, why we can be so confident that we're victorious and that all we've got to do is align ourselves with the Word, with the Spirit, uh, and with Jesus in us, that we can just reinforce the victory that, in fact, has already been won. So we've major emphasis on that. We looked uh, particularly at Ephesians chapter 6, where we looked at the, uh, the weapons uh, of our warfare uh, that it's Paul so uh, well explains in that, uh, in that passage of Scripture. So I think we all understand now that we, we do have the authority. Remember, Adam lost it. God gave it to Adam. Adam lost it. Jesus has won it, won it back, and we now have it. And um, he gave it to us. Uh, uh, Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go. And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. So he's with us. With that authority that he gave to the disciples then, is with us now until the job is finished, until the end of the age. So we know that we have, we know that, we have that authority. Jesus had it, and he's given it to us. He's deputized us primarily to preach the gospel. But we're going to look at that. A little bit later. So our positional truth in Jesus is that we have his authority. We have the backing of heaven behind us, okay? We have authority over the Satan and all the demonic forces that are operating in the spirit realm. The Bible says in Psalm 115, verse 16, it says, The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he's given to man. He created man, Adam, originally to have dominion over the earth. As I say, Adam lost it, Jesus won it back, and now we have it again. But we've got to enforce it, okay? We've got to enforce it. So it's not a defensive battle that we're in, just a, a battle of, of self-preservation, uh, wondering where the enemy's going to strike next, trying to protect ourselves, wondering what's going to happen. No, we're fighting from a position of victory that Jesus has already raised on our behalf. So we're going to just do our declaration again before we start this morning that we've been saying the last few weeks. I'm going to bring it up on the screen. This is a, from a, 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 the book of Ephesians once again. It's a combination from chapter 1 and chapter 6. And we're personalizing it. So, uh, and we're going to make this declaration again so that we know who we are. So I'll read it and then you can say it after me. Um, and God raised me up with Christ and seated me in the heavenly places high above every principality, power and dominion. So let's say it together. And God raised me up. With Christ, and seated me with him in heavenly places, high above every principality and power and dominion. Amen. That's your position. You're ruling and reigning in this life, the word says, through Christ Jesus. Okay? We're above only and not below. We're the head and not the tail. We're ruling. He's given all authority, has been given to us. Okay. And every day... 
we we realize that we're not actually taking ground for the kingdom or we're losing ground. Okay? Uh, that's what, that, that is ultimately what's happening. There's not a, no neutral ground. It's not a passive thing that we're in. It's our job to take back that which has been stolen, to establish the kingdom of God on earth, okay? And to release his life, his power, his glory into the earth. That's what we're here. That's the, the, the purpose of the church. No army. We've been looking at it from a military point of view and using natural illustrations to bring spiritual truths and principles and we've been looking at the example of the soldier of the army of the of the war if you like and no army has ever won a war just being on the defensive this is not about self-preservation it is uh, by holding uh, not just by holding our ground and, and retreating we need to move forward we have to go into the devil's kingdom if we're going to overthrow him if we're going to defeat him we just can't stay standing back so we must move beyond just looking after and preservation to the, to the attack mode. And that's why Jesus said, he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Okay? He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell, hell will not prevail against it. Hell, uh, the word there they're using is Hades. Um, and uh, really the, the meaning of it here in this sense here is the invisible unseen realm of the spirit realm, of Satan's kingdom, okay? It's the, the, the unseen spirit realm rather than a place of where, the, where there's burning and, 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 and hell, that hell. It's more talking about the unseen spirit realm. So in other words, um, Satan's kingdom is not going to prevail against us. The church is going to prevail against that, that gates, those gates of hell. In this scripture, Jesus is referring to two sort of main principles. He's saying, I will build... My church and the, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So we, we, there's two illustrations in there. He's building the church in one hand, and at the same time there's an implication of warfare that we're, we're battling as well as, as, as building. And that's really what we're doing. He, he is building the church, but he's doing it through us and with us. It's a cooperation, if you like, a bit of a joint venture. And he needs our cooperation to be successful in all that he wants to do. So we must think in terms of the church, of building the church, and we talk about that a lot, uh, but also battling the forces of darkness. Uh, many have interpreted this scripture, well, they won't prevail against us. In other words, we're just trying to hold them out. No, it's more than that. It's, it's not that at all. It's not just being in a defensive mode. It's the other way around. We were going to break through his gates and release the captives Amen. that he has hostage. And he has in, the, in his prisons, okay? We're b battling successfully. We're also building together. They go together. Remember, he is already disarmed by Jesus. We are simply reinforcing the victory as we're led and empowered by the Holy Spirit. So spiritual war requires spiritual weapons, and he's given them to us. Second Corinthians says that for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not natural weapons, but they're mighty for the pulling down of strongholds casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, not natural. They're spiritual weapons. So what are they? And that's what we were looking at last week. They're powerful through God. In other words, they're God-anointed, God-appointed to break through and get the job done. And in Jesus, we have already received. When we get born again, we receive these things. Um, and we, we have them, and uh, we have, uh, we're complete in every part of armor, but we need to keep them on. Let's just quickly review what we've covered the last two, two sessions before we move on tonight on how to use the sword of the Spirit in particular. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 20. This was our foundational scripture. And it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the, this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the fire, flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert, and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me, that whenever I speak, words may be given me, that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly, as I should. 
So we had to put all these weapons on. And we, when we got born again, we received these completely in Jesus. And it's actually interesting to compare. I just want to do a little comparison. I was, this wasn't originally part of my notes, but uh, I thought it was quite good and worth including. It was quite interesting when comparing, um, I guess, looking at the, the five weapons or armor mentioned here in Ephesians chapter 6 um, and looking at, I guess, what the opposites of those were. And uh, looking, look, looking at them, and when you're saying we're putting on Jesus, receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we're born again, what, how we receive these. And, and uh, so I just wanted to quickly run through that, because when you look at it, the first one, the belt of truth, the um, Bible says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is truth. So when we put on Jesus, we're receiving that truth. And we're to demonstrate that truth, we're to speak that truth, we're to hold the truth. And of course, the opposite of that is lies. And who's the father of lies? The devil. But we put Jesus on. I thought this was quite interesting. And then we look at righteousness. We put on the breastplate of righteousness. We looked at that. And uh, we know that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That he is Jehovah Sikandu. Right? And what's the opposite of righteousness? Sin. We're to live right, righteous, right living before God. The opposite of that is sin. And where does sin come from? The Bible says that the devil has been sinning from the beginning. I remember Derek Prince once said, sin is not something, sin is a person. It came from the devil. The devil. That's, uh, the reference for that is um, 1 John 3, 8. He who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Then we looked at the uh, shoes of the gospel of peace. And of course, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He is peace. He's Jehovah Shalom. When we... When we proclaim the gospel, we're acknowledging that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's what really the essence of the gospel. We're saying Jesus Christ is Lord. But if we deny Christ, which is the opposite, the Bible says we're actually an antichrist. 1 John 2.22. Anyone who denies that Jesus is the Christ is an antichrist. So we've got Jesus as the Lord on one hand. On the other hand, you've got the spirit of antichrist. And then we hold up the shield of faith. Jesus, of course, in Jesus, it's from him we have our faith. It's, it is basically, our faith is from him and it's in him. He is the author. In other words, he started it all and he's the perfecter, the finisher. Amen. It's all in Jesus. So it's encompassed. He is our shield of faith. The opposite of that, of course, is unbelief and fear. And where does that come from? See the opposites here? And then we put on the helmet of salvation. The Bible says there's no other name under heaven by which man may be saved. Jesus, of course, is our Savior. That's, right. That's obvious. Amen. He gives us, he, he come to save us so that we don't have to go to hell. That we, he's delivered us from death. Devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came to give us life and life abundant. Right. See the opposites. Hallelujah. Helmet of salvation. And then, of course, we take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, which is the Word of God. 1 John 1. In the beginning, sorry, John 1 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is the Word. Right. Jesus is the Word. Amen. Whereas Satan, on the other hand, is the deceiver, who won't, the one who tries to distort the Word of God. Remember, we looked at, you know, if you are the Son of God. Remember casting doubt. Did God really say? Distorts the word of God. Jesus is the word. So we see these opposites. I thought that was quite an interesting comparison. So we looked at the we looked last week, week before, at the at the six weapons, if you like, that uh, are mentioned there in Ephesians uh, chapter six. And as I say, when we we born again and we receive Jesus, we put Jesus on. We're actually putting our armor on. But the key is we need to keep them on. We need to keep them on, and we need to keep them on properly. Um, and uh, when we're led by the Spirit. When we're in the word, we're in right fellowship, we're in submission. These things are all, to, all part of keeping the armor on properly. It can be summed up, actually, in, uh, in one verse of Scripture. If you wanted a, a, a verse of Scripture to summarize all of this, it would be come from the book of James, uh, chapter 4, verse 7. It says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Hallelujah. Flee, Amen. run away, try and escape. The key is submission to God. And resisting the devil. When we've got our armor on, that's exactly what we're doing. When we continually yield to God, when we honor God, when we obey what he's calling us to do and said to do in his word, then we know we are submitting to him 
and uh, we have our armour on, and the devil will flee. So we just need to make sure that our armour's on, church, and really that's what we're talking about. We, know how to, we need, to, need to know how to use it, and particularly this week, we're looking at the attacking weapon of the sword of the Spirit. Most of the armor, other armour was defensive, but the sword of the Spirit is our one attacking weapon, and uh, we, want to, um, we want to move on to that in just a moment. Because I was one thing I'd ran out of time for last week, and I felt it's worthwhile talking about when we just to complete the, I guess the, the message on the armor, and that was uh, when you look at that armor, and we looked at the Roman soldier last week, we're looking looking at him face on, we're looking at him face on, and so we see the helmet of salvation, we see the breastplate, we see the belt, we see the shoes, we see the shield, sword, and all that, looking at it front on. But what about his back? No armor for the back. No armor for the back. And I thought that was quite, uh, quite interesting. It has a significant, probably least twofold. I'm going to bring up two issues. There are probably, there are probably more. As I say, we don't cover everything here on a Sunday. But there were two things that I thought were worth pointing out. And the first thing it tells to me is that well, we never need to turn our back. We should never, ever turn our back on the devil, on our enemy. We're always to face him front on. In other words, and what does that mean? Well, what do you mean to turn your back on the devil? Well, for me, for me, that says to me, hey, we don't say, I give up, I've had enough, I can't do this anymore, it's too hard, you know? We don't backslide. We've got to stay in that, face of, that place of confrontation. It's, um, I've seen many, many things. It's the saddest thing when you see somebody, a believer, a brother or sister, and you all know people, I know you do, that have been in church, been on fire for God, and are now out of the race. Why? I mean, the Christian life is a commitment. It is a sacrifice. It's not always easy, let's be honest. It can be a challenge. We have to come under correction from our leaders. Not pe people don't always like that. Don't tell me what to do. But the Lord disciplines those he loves. We're all changing. We've all got the love. Correction is never to condemn and crush. It's to, it's to help and to build up. To set people free is what it's for. So we need these things in our lives. I had a friend, dear friend, that uh, I got saved and I was passionate about sharing the gospel. And I went and saw this guy and I said to him, I knew he had a few struggles. And we got talking about it. And little been known to me, I'd known him for years and years and years. And he was brought up in an orphanage. And little did I know that he actually used to pray to Jesus. Even as an adult, an unbeliever, he used to... some. Summary, he knew there was something there. So I had the privilege of, of sharing the gospel with him, leading him to Christ. And he came part of our church at the time, not this church, came, came part of our church at the time. And, uh, and he had a lot of issues going on. I mean, a lot of people come, God accepts us and loves us just as we are, but he, he came in and he had some issues, some struggles, some hurts from the past, abuse. And uh, he came in. And he came under the word and he was excited and it was, it was, it was great just to see the, the hunger and the thirst and, 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 and miracles. It was just awesome what was happening in his life. And, uh, but then, of course, you know, God starts dealing with us on a few things. Isn't this typically the pattern, you know? And, and he starts dealing with a few things. And this guy struggled with some of this thing. He, struggled, he struggled with some of the, I guess, the commitments and the sacrifices and the corrections that, that we come under. And, um, and in the end, he said, oh, it's just too hard. And he turned his back. On the, and then the devil exposed back. He was able to attack him. And then came doubts. Then came discouragement. Then came disbelief. Remember, we looked at these things last week. That's the pattern. Doubt, discouragement, disbelief, disobedience, death. That's the downward spiral. And I saw this happen in this guy's life. And a, fr a friend of mine, good friend. And so much so that he didn't want anything to do with the church. So I sort of, this was, what am I going to do? What am I going to do here? And so it created a problem. I, I, won't, I won't talk any more about, um, about the thing. But at the end of the day, this guy's gone. He's backslidden. Whether he's going to make it to heaven or not, I don't know. I wouldn't judge that. It's not my job to do that. But uh, uh, he certainly, he, he, I don't even know whether he's got a faith anymore. He's certainly uh, not living a, a Christian lifestyle, that's for sure. And certainly not in church. But, um, so that's, we don't turn our back. We don't turn our back. We don't say it's too hard, we're giving up. We have challenges, yes, but never turn your back because that's the first step to destruction when we turn our back. Secondly, we're not always able to protect our own back. 
in a war, sometimes we're not always to protect our own back. So and when we looked at the Roman legions and the success of the Roman armies and, Romans and, and armies throughout time, they fought in close ranks, side by side, had their shields up. They were there marching together in, in, in unison, together, going up row at a time, taking ground from the enemy, pushing back the enemy. They stood together. It, was, it, was never, you know, it wasn't one person on their own. It was an army, a group of people. Well, the church is the army of God. Amen. The church is the army of God. And we need to stand side by side just like the soldiers do. We've got to have each other's back. You know, they're saying, has he got my back? Have you got my back? In other words, are you watching out for me? Do you care for me? Are you going to help me when I need you? That's what it means. And so that's the spiritual implication there. We need each other. We've got to be part of a church. I mean, this is our church army. We're the, this is our battalion, if you like, Victory Christian Center. This is our battalion where, uh, where we're linked into. This is our regiment. And, uh, and so where we come here, and we come under discipline, like an army. We're taught, and we're trained, we're equipped, aren't we, for the battle. With the word of God, as Shekinah was so rightfully pointing out before, one of the strengths of our church here. Great training and equipping church. Great teaching church. So we come under discipline. And we must trust our, other, our fellow soldiers. We ought to know that we've got people there that really care for us, they're going to watch our backs, not stab us in the back. Too much, of seen, too much of that in the body of Christ. Rivalry, envy, backstabbing, gossip. Not good. Right. Army must be unified. We must have each other's back. And we must know it too. It's not just being it. We've got to know. We've got to have confidence. And that's why I say, when you pray for Di and I before, that's awesome. We know. We yeah. know that you love us. We know that you're meaning that. You know, And it's not just empty, hollow words. We know that you've got our backs. And so people said to me, there's a lot of stuff happening up in Bangladesh at the moment. There's so been some killings and some ISIS have, have now really stepped up up there. You know, does that concern you? I says, no, it doesn't. That's right. I know. I've got people that are praying. Amen. The angels of God are around me. Hallelujah. And he's going to guide us and order our steps. Amen. He orders the steps of the righteous. So I've got faith that everything's going to be fine. So it yeah. doesn't, doesn't particularly bother me. I mean, we need to be wise, absolutely, when we go up there and diligent. But at the end of the day, our lives are in his hands and I trust him 100%. So we need to do that. So let's protect each other, okay? Instead of, instead of kicking each other when we're down. People make a mistake. People fall. We don't point the finger. We help them to get back up again. That's really what the job of the body of Christ is, okay? We're not to judge and condemn, but we're to help them get back up again. So we avoid criticism. Intercede instead. That's what you want to do. Remember, we're not fighting people. Yeah. Principalities and powers. Right. And um, people sometimes become vulnerable. And that's why we've got to have their backs. We all go through challenges. We've got to have each other's back. We must always build up and speak life. That's, the, that's our job, not to criticize and judge. Amen? So, back to the sword of the Spirit. We want to look at... Um, uh, we want to look at how to use it effectively. We looked last week at what it was and why it's powerful, but this week I wanted to look at just a number, a couple, a few aspects. This is not an exhaustive list by any means of, of how we can use the sword of the Spirit. The Spirit, of course, is referenced because He is the power behind the war, word. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Amen. the sword of the Spirit. And it started off in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, didn't it? It said, we are strong in his mighty power. In other words, no spirit, no power. The power comes from the spirit. We, um, we, uh, we can, uh, it's not just about words. Uh, remember, we looked last week at the seven sons of Sceva and how uh, they were trying to cast the, the demon out of the person. And uh, the demon spoke back and said, well, Jesus I know and Paul I know. But who are you? In other words, who do you think you are? Why? They were doing exactly, saying exactly the same words as, as Jesus and Paul, but they didn't have the Spirit. No power. That's right. We need the Spirit. That's, the, that's why it's called the sword of the Spirit. We need the Spirit. So, armed with only the sword, remember we only got one weapon because we only need one. The Word of God is all powerful. It's the mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. We step out and we fight our enemies. So this week, as I say, we want to look at how to effectively use the sword. And so let's move on now to the final part of this passage of Scripture. And let's bring this up again from Ephesians chapter 6 this time, verses 18 to 20. So we've been saying to put on all the armor, and then it says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. 
And always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. Pray for me also, that whenever I speak, words may be given to me, so that I may fiercely make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am, ambas- for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Now Paul's using a number of key words there. Pray, speak, make known, declare. We could say that using the sword of the Spirit is primarily by speaking. Remember, it's the, the, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. The Word of God there is the word rhema, which is the spoken word of God. So we could say that the sword of the Spirit is not unsheathed, like in the natural, taken out of its sheath until we speak it. That's the key. That's the key. Now, there are many ways that we can use the sword. There's many ways we can speak the word of God. Uh, each of these is powerful and is a, absolutely a valid use of, uh, of the sword. You, we could say these are weapons within the weapon. These are different ways of using the sword, just as you could in the natural. I want to look at four, and as I say, this is not a, 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 a total list, but there are four key ones that I believe are important for us to, 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 to look at. The first one is the obvious one, is what we would call the weapon of prayer. It says firstly, doesn't it? And pray in the spirit. And pray. The first thing, and pray. And pray. In other words, all these things I've mentioned, the belt of truth, breastplate of righteousness, shield of faith, gospel of peace, helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit. Now you've got all these on. Now the next thing to do is pray. Amen. And pray. This is how you use them. And pray in the spirit. God alone is given to the victory. We've got to look to God, um, you know, completely for our instructions. He's our commander in chief, remember? We, we want to be led by the Spirit, and we do this through prayer. And we can be sure if we do that, if we're connected with Him in prayer, we're going to be triumphant. Amen. Steady line of communication with our commander in chief is the key. He alone knows how to lead us into victory. We need to pray. Because he's using us, remember, he's given us the authority for his will to be done on earth. That's why he needs us. He's partnered with us. God will move through the prayers of his people. Yeah. And so, firstly, we've got to pray. In the area of our own lives, of course. We've got to take responsibility for our own lives. That's right. So it makes sense to pray for ourselves. For wisdom, for peace, for provision protection for health and so on but as we've looked at and the whole theme of this message is not just about protecting ourselves and providing for ourselves it's about a kingdom it's about a lost world and so we need to engage in the battle in the area outside our own lives the next area that i think we all need all applies to, to all of us is the area of our families those things we're directly responsible for and foremostly our family and men i'd say something to the men here this morning you're the head of the house. That's right. God's holding you responsible Amen. to guide, to govern, and particularly to guard your household. Hallelujah. So men, don't leave it to the woman to do all the praying, to be using the sword. It's our job as men yeah. to be guarding our family, to watching out for the spiritual attacks against our spouse, against our marriage, against our children. Amen. Every morning, I learned this as a young believer, and it was almost, I don't even know whether I got taught it, it was almost instinctive. I would not, I would not dream of starting any day without a declaration over my family. Hallelujah. Every day I do that. Praise I commit the day into the Lord. I spend my time with the Lord. Sometimes it's not a lot, but I always, the part of my prayer in the morning to the Lord is, thank you, Lord. I plead the covering of the blood over my family, over my family, over my home, my finances, my possessions, yeah. Lord. I bind and I cancel any one of Satan's assignment against me or my family. Any instrument, agent, or demon spirit that would try and come against us, I bind, rebuke, and declare null and void. I declare that no evil befalls us. No plague comes near our dwelling. I declare no weapon formed against us will prosper. Any tongue that rises in judgment against us, I do condemn. For this Lord is my heritage as a servant of you. And our righteousness is from you, Lord Jesus. Satan, I rebuke you right now. I cast you from us. I plead the blood. I declare we're strong in you and in the power of your might. I declare the joy of the Lord is our strength. I thank you, Father. I declare my, my household is in peace and in unity and harmony. That by his stripes we're healed. And so I pray like that every morning. Same prayer. 
different words, slightly different every time. I don't, I don't, don't read anything. It just comes out of the Spirit. But I take it seriously. We've got a responsibility. Fathers, husbands, for your household. So we need to pray in that area. Third area is are there areas that we have authority and influence in? For instance, as a leader here at Victory Christian Center, I pray every week for our outreach teams, for the CAP ministry, for all the different things that we're doing. I, I pray for the ministry teams. When I was in, in the secular world, um, well, I still am, I guess, in a way, with, with, with my business, but when I was working in the corporate world, I, probably as better description, I, I managed quite a large company. And I used to pray for my staff and my business. I wouldn't say every day. I might, might be caught out there if I said that. But certainly most days, and certainly very frequently, I would pray over my, my business. Because I knew well, I had the authority in the natural. So I, need to, I thought, right, God's holding me responsible here. And I want the best for my staff, for my business. I want it to prosper. We can make a difference. This is what I'm talking about, taking ground on the devil, not just standing back waiting what's going to happen. We've got to be proactive. And so I used to pray over my business. Amazing. And the, 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 the amount of times I had to share the gospel with staff, the, the miracles that I saw just in my business and in the business was just tremendous. Absolutely tremendous. Uh, for the sake of time, I was going to share a testimony, but we're... I'm going to run out of time, so we'll leave that to another day about that. But you see, the thing is this. If we can't defeat the devil in our own life, in our family, in the areas of responsibilities, how the heck are we going to get out there and take a city and take a nation? That's right. So Amen. that's what we've got to do. So start where you are. There's no condemnation where anyone is. But let's start using the authority. Let's start using the sword, the word, in our lives. In the lives of our family, in the lives of the areas and the people that we've got influence over. It might be a ministry team in church. It might be something in your, your job situation. It might be a social organization that you're part of. It might be extended family. Whatever. Using your authority. Declaring God's goodness. Coming against the demonic powers that are trying to steal, kill, and destroy. It's our job, church. It's our job. So there are many types of prayer. Uh, we're talking about the weapon of prayer. Many types of prayer, and uh, if you want a teaching on prayer, you go and join Bible College next year, and you'll get to do the prayer module, uh, and that'll be absolutely fantastic, and you'll learn a lot more than I'm able to share in this very brief time this morning. But uh, all types of prayer, really, in a way, is, is a form of spiritual warfare, because, in fact, what we're doing is we're invoking God into situations, aren't we, when we're praying? That's what we're doing, effectively. So, but there are certainly some types of prayers and the Bible College, for instance, discusses and, and points out all the different types of prayers that, that there are. And, uh, but there are some types that I think are really useful um, when it comes to uh, the spiritual battle, the spiritual warfare that we're talking about. And I'll talk about three of them just quickly before we move on to the, the next weapon. The first one is praying in tongues. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 8, we're to pray in the Spirit with all kinds of prayer. Now, this is primarily talking about praying in the Spirit, of course, is generally a reference to praying in our heavenly language, the gift of tongues that all believers have got. But it's also more than that, though. It's being led by the Spirit, being in the Spirit, and, uh, and so on. So we don't understand when we're praying in tongues what we're praying. Um, the Holy Spirit gives us an unction and leads us in that area, and he, prompt, he prompts us to pray accordingly. And he knows what we need. So when we're praying in the Spirit, we know that we're right in the center of God's will. Uh, I'm sure that our tongues uh, would be majority of them. I don't understand what I'm saying when I'm in tongues. Sometimes we can get the gift of interpretation, but most of the time we don't. Our mind doesn't, it's not, yeah. not, doesn't go through our mind. It's coming from our spirit. So we don't understand. But I would be very sure that, in fact, our tongue language would be very much based around the Word of God. Right. I've got no doubt about that at all. Um, and so we use... Our spirit language. We cooperate with the leading and the unction of the Holy Spirit. We give him our tongue, in other words, to work through. Now, it doesn't always have to be warfare, but it certainly can be. And you, sometimes you, get, you feel about I don't know about you, but I'll, sometimes if I get an agitation in my spirit, something's wrong. I'm just not feeling comfortable for you. There's an uneasiness. What's going on? I'm sensing something. Well, that's generally a demonic activity. Something, something's not right somewhere. So what do I do? Straight into tongues. I don't understand it. So I'm praying in my heavenly language. Praying, praying, and powerfully, forcefully praying. This is not a passive thing until I feel a release or before I get revelation quite often. 
Aha. God shows me something or I just feel a release. I've achieved something. I don't know what's going on. We, don't, we won't know till heaven what, what was being achieved, the, the disasters or the things we may have averted. People say, oh, look at what the devil's doing. I think, man, I reckon we've averted far more than, uh, from the devil than, we, than he's ever actually achieved through the saints of the prayers, actually. We just don't, we just don't recognize that. We don't, it's not so visible to us, obviously. So um, we, uh, we get that. Sometimes a, 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 an anger might stir up within us. and Sometimes we, we, a boldness comes upon us. And we start praying. We're not actually sure what it is. Just go with it. We're led by the Spirit. The Spirit's trying to do something through us. He needs our tongue. And so that's warfare generally, I would find, when we're in that mode, you generally, my feeling would be that that would be uh, a sense of we're dealing with things in the Spirit realm. We're dealing with things in the Spirit realm. And, of course, we know that Romans 8.26 tells us quite clearly that the Spirit helps us when we don't know what to pray. He makes intercession for us. This is talking about praying in our heavenly language, using the gift of tongues. The devil hates it, too, because he can't understand it. That's right. He can't understand it. It's a very powerful type of prayer. Second one is the prayer of binding and loosing. Binding and loosing prayers um, uh, are mainly used, I believe, in uh, direct encounters with the demonic realm. Not entirely, but mainly, I think that's the the key context that they are used for. Matthew 16, 19 says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So in other words, God, God says, here's the keys, I'm giving it for you to do, I'm not going to do it. Remember, you've got the authority, you've got the responsibility, you do it. And he said, keys indicate access. You're giving access to the heaven. And here at the word heaven here, once again, it does, English doesn't always bring it out. Is, is not so much talking about the place where we go when we die. It's talking about the spirit realm, the air of the heavens, okay, where the spirits, where spirit beings dwell and operate. So we have access to that spirit realm, and when we declare something on earth, it's released into effect in that spirit realm. Hallelujah. That's how it works. When we declare it here, yeah. then it's released into the spirit realm brought into effect. Binding is like a, I've done a bit of research on this, and it's, I wouldn't say I've got it all completely sussed, but it's, um, it's like a spiritual handcuffing, tying up. You, we can bind a demon spirit, just like we would tie someone up with ropes or chains. We can, we can tie up their activities. We cannot bind a person's free will. We can't bind a person's free will. Don't try and do that. Yeah. It's not scriptural. We can't, but we can demand. Remember, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. It's the principalities and powers, the demonic influences on that person that we're trying to deal with. That's what we're talking about here. So we can't bind a person's free will, but we can bind the demonic influences and the forces that are uh, affecting and influencing that person. And binding is not the same, it's not the same uh, activity as casting out a demon. Deliverance is, is, is not that at all. Um, casting out should generally bring lasting results. But binding is like a, a temporary binding up of that activity. People say, oh, we bind Satan up and he's bound forever. Well, no, he's not. He's still around doing his things. You can bind his demons and his activities for the situation. But, of course, the devil is still not going to be dealt with until Jesus comes back completely. Um, and so we, uh, we cast down, we bind, these, uh, we bind these demons. For instance, here's an example. Imagine someone at work is hassling you. You've got to, and you haven't done anything wrong, but this person, for some reason, is just niggly and hassling you and giving you grief, and you can't understand it. And you discern in your, in, your, in, your, in, your, in, your, in your spirit, hello, there's something more going on here. There's a spiritual thing going on here. This is a spiritual battle. So what do you do? You go into prayer, and you use the prayer of binding and loosing. You bind up this demonic influence that's operating through that person that's giving you the hard time. Now, does that mean that person's delivered? No, but it does mean that they're not able to affect you any longer. That's but how we use binding and loosing, okay? And loosing is very much the opposite, where we lo loose people from the captivity uh, of situations from being bound. Uh, so as I say, for the sake of time, I've, I'll keep moving, but we could talk more about that. So we bind, we prohibit, we ban. We don't let operate. We stop yeah. demonic activity, things that are contrary to God's will, the devil's schemes, his plans. So primarily, this is used against demonic activity. There are other applications, but... Um, yeah, we do that. And the other thing we don't do, and I just, people mean well, but sometimes people say, oh, you know, I, I lose the love of God 
onto people. Well, that's not scriptural either. The love of God's not bound. So we just use these in the right context. Look, if we get it wrong now and again, it doesn't really matter. But, but, but you know, we, we need to be trained in our warfare and the use of the sword of the Spirit. So the third kind of prayer, that's binding and loosing, and we've looked at tongues. The third one, the last one, is um, confession and proclamation. The word confess, we think, means to admit or to own up, and in, in, a, in, a, in a context it does. But in the, in the New Testament meaning of the word, um, the word uh, confession or to confess means to say the same as, to come into agreement with. So for us as believers, our confession is when we say with our mouths, we agree with what the Word of God says. That's really what confession is. And uh, we agree, and we line ourselves up. And when we do that, we have the full backing of Jesus, of his authority. Proclamation is uh, similar, but it, uh, in very simple terms, we could say that proclamation is confession made more aggressive, made louder. It's a clear declaration of something. For instance, an example could be, if I'm picking something up and I feel a twinge in my back, now what could I say? I could speak life or death here. I could say, oh, no, 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 no. my back, oh, no, I've injured my back. No, I don't. I say, oh, by his stripes I'm healed. Yep, that's, right. that's confession. Amen. That's confession. Then proclamation is, when I'm in a prayer meeting with all of you guys, I declare, by his stripes we're healed, church. And we're making it powerful. In our prayer meetings in, in a Sunday morning, for instance, we're mainly doing prayers of proclamation. We're decreeing things in the spirit realm. That's the difference. Proclamation, confession made more aggressive. Can we turn that air conditioning off? It's terribly, it's getting hot in here. Maybe it's just me. <laughs> oh, no, I saw a couple nodding off. It's a short sale sign. It's getting too hot. And It's either that or the preacher's getting boring, and I think that's impossible. So, so it must be getting too hot. <laughs> Let's turn, that, uh, turn those ones off at the back too there, Jack. Let's wake the people up. Um, otherwise, get, 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 get you have to all to do a lap otherwise and bend down and touch your toes. And... <laughs> right. Uh, proclamation. So it's a type of spiritual warfare. It's releasing the authority of God's word into a situation. That's really what proclamation is. Firstly, in our own lives, as we've talked about, lives of our family, the situations around us, maybe a political situation, something to do to our nation. We declare things. There are countless situations where we need uh, that power released. Job 22, 28 says, We shall decree a thing, and it shall be established. That's proclamation. We decree things. Based on Scripture, not just any old silly willy nilly thing that we think is a good idea, it's got to be backed by the Word. Okay, not just our own thoughts or ideas or our desires. It's got to be backed by the Word. It's not in the Word. It's not the will of God. We want the will of God. We want the Word of God. As we proclaim like that, it, it also builds our faith, makes us stronger in our faith because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. When we actually declare it ourselves, that's the greatest way to build faith in our lives. It confirms God's truth in our lives. And also what it does is it lets the devil know that we know. Yes. Amen. It lets the devil know that we know. So the spoken word, the rema, is the first aspect of using the sword of the spirit. Tongues, binding and loosing, profession, confession sorry, and proclamation. Three key things of, 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 of prayer as a spiritual weapon as using the sword of the spirit. The next... Uh, weapon we're going to look at as a sort of an aspect of using the sword is the weapon of preaching. Once again, spoken from our mouth, sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, rhema word, spoken word, is when we preach. And we're primarily here talking about preaching the gospel in church, but also obviously in our community and in the world around us. There is tremendous power when the Word of God is preached. And uh, Isaiah 55, 11 says, My word goes out from my mouth, it will not return to me empty or void, but it will accomplish all I've sent it to do. So there's an inherent power in the word of God that when we preach it, it has effect. But primarily, I believe we're talking about the preaching of the gospel. All of God's, all of God's word is good and needs to be declared. But the gospel message itself is very, very powerful and needs to be. And that's why he's made it the Great Commission. He said, yeah, all of God's word is good news, yes, but there's real good news amongst that. The key message of the whole Bible is God's plan of salvation for mankind. 
And that's why they call it the Great Commission. It's the core message. Romans 10, 13 to 15 says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one that they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one of the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The shoes of the gospel of peace. How beautiful it is. So we've got to preach the gospel. It's the Great Commission. How can people believe unless they hear, unless they know? Our job is the, is the voice of Jesus to say, hey guys, we've got a problem here. Your sin has separated you from God. You're heading for destruction, but here's an escape plan, and his name is Jesus. Hallelujah. And we share the wonderful gospel, yes. the preaching of the gospel, the most powerful thing. It is so powerful. It, it is a mo very, very powerful weapon. One, the gospel has the power to save people. In itself, it has the power to save people. Yeah. Romans 1.16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God Hallelujah. unto salvation. Amen. The power of God. The word there is the word dunamis. It's like spiritual dynamite. That's where the dynamite comes from. The gospel message is, is like spiritual dynamite. The word dunamis means strength, power, ability. In other words, we could rephrase that. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it has, it has the ability to save people. It has the power to save people. It has the strength to save people. Dunamis also means the inherent power of something residing within itself. So within God's word, within this gospel message, is the power right. to bring salvation, to break through all the strongholds of people's minds and thinking and deceptions. All we've got to do is speak it out and release it with the sword into the, into, 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 the, into the lives of those that don't yet know Jesus. So the gospel message has within itself the power to save souls. It's a, it's a supernatural seed, and we do a teaching and sharing your faith about that, how it's a supernatural seed and, um, and how it can achieve salvation in somebody's life. Secondly, the gospel is like a, a divine key to unlock the hearts of an unbeliever. Romans 1.16 says, I'm, I'm sorry, Isaiah 61.1. It says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim freedom for the captives and to release from darkness the prisoners. Release the captives. The release the prisoners. We imagine the human heart like a lock. Yeah. And the key to unlock the heart is the gospel message. Amen. Now, here's what happens. God is relying for us to preach the word, to put the key into the lock. That's when we preach the gospel. We're putting the key into the lock of the human heart. Yeah, that's right. Now, we can't save anybody. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Amen. As he convicts, as he brings revelation about the love of God and the truth of who God is, and his goodness leads them to repentance, he's turning that key in the lock, and their hearts are opened, Hallelujah. and Jesus Amen. can come in. He can let them out of the prison and into freedom. That can only come in Jesus. So, the lock is the heart. The, the, the key is the gospel. And we're the ones who puts the key in. The gospel reveals, you see, Jesus like nothing else. It declares that there is no other name. There's no other key to get you out of prison. There's no other name under heaven by which man may be saved. No one comes to the Father except through him. He's the only key. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The third thing that the gospel does, preaching of the gospel does, it exposes the devil's lies. Most people out there think, hey, I'm a good person, I'm going to go to heaven. If there is a heaven, I don't know, it doesn't matter. He's deceived people. When we preach the gospel, we're not just glorifying Jesus, but we're exposing the devil's lies. We're exposing his ultimate plan of destruction for all human beings. We tell the prisoners that they're actually in a spiritual jail, and we show them the way out. We're exposing the devil. Bible says that Jesus, if we don't do this, we're actually, if we don't do this, we're actually by default, in a way, siding with the devil. Jesus says in Matthew 12, 40, whoever's not for me is against me. Yeah. So doing nothing, it really is not an option. By preaching the gospel, we're confirming that we're true disciples of Jesus Christ. It's a very powerful thing. And finally, the gospel, the preaching of the gospel reveals the love of God. Amen. It reveals the love of God. Oh. It, it reveals God's character. And we know, and here's the powerful part about the love of God, that it never fails. 
The love of God is the most powerful force in the universe. God. Love God's love never fails. So preaching of the word, speaking it out, proclaiming the gospel, another very important aspect of the sword of the spirit. The third one, we've got two to go, so we're getting there. I've got five minutes to get two more done. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> third one is the weapon of our testimony. Once again, something that is spoken of what God has done. Luke 21, 12 to 15. This is Jesus talking to his disciples about end times. He says, before all this, they will seize you and they will persecute you. They will hand you over to the synagogues and put you in prison. And you'll be brought before kings and governors and all on account of my name. And so you will bear testimony to me. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand on how you will defend yourselves. For I will give you the words and wisdom. And none, here's the key thing. And none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. None of your, they will not will be able to resist or contradict. And that's the key, that final verse. When we bear testimony, when we talk about Jesus and what he's done for us, people can't re resist or contradict. They can't argue. They can argue with our theology. But they can't argue with the testimony. I love the story about the blind man in the Bible, in John chapter 9. And this blind man, Jesus, healed the blind guy. And the, uh, the Pharisees heard about this. They were trying to get Jesus. They were worried about his influence. They dragged the blind man before him. They, they were asking him, how did this happen? They wanted to hear all his theology. They wanted to find out what actually happened. What do this? And what did the blind man said? He didn't, he didn't try and argue scripture. He didn't try and, 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 and provide an apologetics argument. He, all he said is, all I know is once I was blind and now I see. Yeah. And they couldn't argue. It silenced them in the end. They got very frustrated with them. But at the end of the day, he said, well, I'm not going to argue with you. I'm not, I, I don't know. I don't understand all these things. But one thing I do know, once I was blind, now I see. They can see that I can see. People can't argue with that. They can't argue with that. And that's why the power of a testimony is so, so, so awesome. Um, in Revelation, yeah, we've got to give testimony. Sorry, just one other thing. We've got, to, we've got to give testimony as well. Isaiah 63. 3, 7 says, we will tell of the goodness of God. And we should be doing that. That's a very good way to witness, is to be telling about what God's done in our lives. It gets people thinking. They might think you're a bit weird, maybe, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's powerful. It's happened to you. And they've got to decide, are you a liar? Are you a nutter? Or is it true? And if they know you well enough, they'll say, well, I don't think this person's a liar. Would they make that up? Or I can see that they're not mad. So really, the only other option is it's true. And then they've got to say, well, what do I do with it? It's very powerful. Very powerful. Revelation 12, 20, 12 verses 10 to 11. I heard a vo loud voice in heaven saying, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and their word of the testimony. And they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Verse 11, they triumphed over him. Some versions say they overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimonies. Uh, because this is important. Because this, who overcame? Not God. The saints overcame. We overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Okay? In other words, it's a personal battle between us and the devil. We overcome him by the blood of the lamb. See, we overcome Satan when we person personally testify to what the word of God says that the blood of Jesus has done in our lives. That's what that means. When we personally testify what the word of God says, the blood of Jesus does for us. When we use these three things, the word of God, the blood of Jesus, our personal, um, the blood of Jesus and our personal te testimony, I tell you, we triumph and we overcome. Very powerful principle. I remember, and I'll tell you a quick story before we close. When I was uh, traveling back from Bangladesh, uh, not last time, time before, probably 2013, I think it was, I uh, had, had, had a, uh, I prayed to God whenever I travel. I said, give me a good seat, please, Lord. Please give me a good seat. Long haul flight. I just don't like it. And I uh, want a good seat so I can try and get some sleep and some rest and not have too much hassle. Got onto the plane at Auckland. The plane was chocker. I'd got a seat on the three on the outside, window seat. And I saw the plane was filling and filling and filling. I thought, oh, just kept praying in tongues. Anyway, no one sat next to me. No one sat next to me. No one sat next to me. End of the day, I saw that the doors had obviously closed. They were getting ready to take off, and I'm looking around. Everybody seemed to be seated. 
I couldn't see an empty seat in the plane except the two next to me. Not one, two. I quickly threw my gear on there, took the aisles up, put my feet out, and I claimed that spot, man. I slipped like a baby all the way to Bangkok. I tell you, it was just magnificent. Oh, thank you, Lord. Well, we're going to come back. I get to the airport at Bangkok for the flight back. I thought, oh, Lord, you've done it for me once. You'll do it again. And I just had this awful, <laughs> I had this feeling in my spirit. I thought, nah, this is not good. Oh, come on, where's your faith, man? And I pray, pray, pray. Oh, no, this is not good, not good. And I, but I, I confessed it, but in my heart, I wasn't believing it. I don't know, there's just something. Anyway, get on the plane once again, chocker. Down towards the back. And then we've got three seats right at the front of a section before where the toilets are. You do not want to be next to the toilets on a long haul flight. Also, you don't want to be behind the bulkhead because that's where the babies are. Oh, oh, Lord. So here I am, one, two, three on the side, where I am, in the middle. And then next on, on the window side, this huge. Muslim man gets on the plane and sits next to me. You can tell by all his gear and his robes and how he was. Yeah, that's okay. And then this other guy, him to be a Kiwi guy, sits on the other side. That's okay. This guy gets on. He's half drunk. And we get going on the flight. And he starts talking to me. Oh, you know, where, where, where do you come from? What are you doing? And so in the end of the day, I think, right, well, this guy said, oh, well, actually, I've been on, um, I'm a Christian. We've been on the mission. Christians? And he started abusing me. Oh, I hate Christians. I mean, this guy was the most rudest, obnoxious, loudest man I have ever met in my life. And I've met some bad ones, but this guy was in a category all of his own. He says, Christians? Yeah, you hypocrites. What do you want to do that for? It's a waste of, you know, believe that rubbish, do you? I thought you're an intelligent man. It's absolute garbage, he said. I mean, he's talking along these veins, but not quietly, just to me. I'm, oh, a plane's been hearing this. And I'm, I'm going, oh, I can't. I thought, what do I do here? I said, man, this is a, oh, you know, I, I didn't need to be a rocket science to realize I was in a spiritual battle then. And um, so I, right, so anyway, so anyway, this went on for hours. Hours, hours, hours. And I said, oh, yeah, we started to tell him a little bit what we're doing. And then, then eventually, you know, it's the, it's the law, isn't it, of conversation. You let someone has their say, then this, you get your turn to have your say, you know. So I started to bring in my testimony and tell him how I got saved and how I used to be like him and never believed. And, but this is what's happened to me. Testimony, testimony. I didn't try and argue with his theology. Testimony, testimony. And we go through the thing. And then I said to him, and, he's, and then I said, I was up in Bangladesh there. And, you know, and he said, oh, I said, I was a Muslim country. He said, well, Muslims, he said. I hate Muslims as well. Because <laughs> the Muslims sitting there like this, and I'm like, oh, no. I'm the first one who's going to cop it, you know. He'll bring out a... <laughs> and um, I thought, oh, no. And I was like, oh, it's just so uncomfortable. And there's people looking around. I mean, oh, Lord, just get me out of here. And I knew that I had 10 more hours of this. Oh, please, Father. So we... <laughs> Carry on, and, he, and he's like, and he's drinking more and more, 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 more. I think you've had enough. So I want more. <laughs> and, 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 and so we go on. Anyway, so I'm sure it me. I, for the sake of time, I'll cut it short. We get to a point now, and the lights are all off. Everybody's supposed to go to sleep in the plane. You're supposed to be quiet. No, he's another drink. And I said, mate, I've got to get some sleep. Sorry, yeah. No, I nearly said his name. I better not do that. And um, I said, I just said, he said, I said, oh, I have to. He's going to struggle to sleep on planes, to be honest. And he's, oh, mate, I've got the thing. And he digs in his pocket here, brings out this unmarked plastic bag with these pills in it. Now, this is not a good idea, church, to take uh, unknown pills from complete strangers. Um, but I was desperate. I says, I, says, I says, yeah, brother, give them to me. <laughs> oh, I downed them. Anyway, they were, luckily enough, they were sleeping pills. And when we just come from Bangkok, I'm thinking, oh, goodness. Oh, did he get through customs with the white stuff, you know? But um, anyway, so we're on the plane. And, uh, and I took these pills, and thank goodness it, 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 it sent me out. Woke up, whenever it was, getting close to Auckland, getting in, and he was sort of calmed down a little bit. In the middle of the night, too, I'd sort of just heard through my sleep a huge argument with the uh, air hostesses, and there was, I think they were going to try and kick him off. So I sort of half expected the police to be waiting. It was that bad. Really, it was that bad. I've never seen anything like it. Uh, I thought the police would be waiting for him. Anyway, we go through customs, get our bags, and all that, and then I, uh, I get uh, waiting for my domestic flight down to Wellington. And next thing I hear somebody in the bar yelling out, Hey, Peter, Peter! I go, Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I go over and I see him there, and he's got a beer. It's 10 o'clock in the morning, and he's got a beer. He's got a beer, mate. I said, No, no, she's good. And, uh, and it's good. And anyway, we got, I said, Oh, well, you know, mate, good to meet you. And, you know, and I didn't, 
all through that, the anointing, the peace of God was on me. I gave my testimony. I wasn't threatened by it. I didn't, you know, he was threatened. He, was, he wanted to get in a fight with me one stage. Come on, mate, whatever fight, mate, I'll do you. You know, he, this, he, was, he was so aggressive. And in the end, I said, oh, mate, well, you know, it's good to know. And I, you know, hey, mate, remember, Jesus loves you. And he said, oh, look, he said, I've been on flights all around the world. I do a lot of traveling. And he's quite a wealthy guy. And, um, and he, said, he said, this is one of the best fight I've ever had. I said, well, I'm glad it was for you, brother. It was, it was the worst for me. Uh, and then, then what he does is he, he gives me a hug. And he, st- and he starts crying. He starts crying. Unbelievable. The blood of the Lamb. The word of our testimony. We overcome. Most powerful example I've ever seen. But it can happen on a far smaller scale. Every time we're giving Jesus glory for what he's doing in our lives, we're overcoming, we're taking ground for the kingdom. We can all do that day by day. We do that day by day. That was a dramatic example. But boy, it showed to me so clearly the power of the testimony. I didn't try and argue with him. I just loved him, accepted him, encouraged him, and shared what God had done in my life. In the end, the love of God never fails. It's irresistible. And here's this big, tough guy crying in my arms. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Blood of the Lamb. Blood of the Lamb. When we declare that, it talks about our redemption. It talks about our forgiveness. It's, the, it's the, the thing that cleanses us. It makes us whole. It's our, it talks about our justification, our righteousness. It talks about our sanctification, our holiness. I've got a, I've got a whole, whole teaching here on that, which we've just ran out of time on. Very powerful. What the Word of God says that the, about the blood, of the blood of the Lamb does in our lives. Very powerful, our testimony. The last of our four weapons, and we'll just wrap up with this now, close in a few minutes. I'm going to have to cut it a little bit short. But uh, we've talked about um, prayer. We've talked about the preaching of the gospel. We've talked about testimony. The other use of the sword of the Spirit when we're speaking is praise. Very powerful weapon. Praise, praise, praise. When, we, when we're praising God, I said, but he inhabits the praises of his people. When we're praising God, he comes and we draw strength from him. Where the presence of God is, the devil can't operate in a, an atmosphere of praise. The devil hates it. He flees. He cannot stay in an atmosphere of praise. The Bible says we're to come into his presence. Right? We come into his gates with thanksgiving, through his courts with praise. That he inhabits the praises of his people. Praise also brings freedom. Remember, the, remember Paul and Silas in prison. And, and the jailers there. What, 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 the, what does the word say in Acts 16, 25 and 26? They were, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing praises. To God and the prisoners heard them and suddenly there was such a great earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everybody's bands were loosed so the principle here is that praising there it brings us out of oppression okay it sets us free because we're not what are we doing we're not focusing on ourselves any longer oh poor me oh God what's happening to me we're focusing on God it sets us free Amen. praise brings freedom for us just as the praise opened the natural prison doors, they open the door for us. They release us. Praise brings protection and victory. Psalm 8, 2. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. So praise invokes the protection of God. It silences our enemies. It stops our enemies. I love the story of Jehoshaphat in Second Chronicles chapter 20, verses 20 to 22. Listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets and you will be successful. After consulting with the people, Jehoshaphat appointed the men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out ahead of the army saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. And they began to sing and praise. And then the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir who were invading Judah, and they were defeated as they sang praises. As they sang, the Lord responded, and he'll do the same for us today. It is a very powerful way to release the power of God into a situation. And um, we, uh, when we actually sing, and that's why most songs that we sing, you'll notice them, they're full of the word. They're full of the word. There's a reason for that. The sword of the Spirit. Amen. They go together. Praise and the sword go together. 
So I've just had to cut that very short. There's more things I wanted to talk about, praise, but for the sake of time, we will wrap up now. But um, uh, we want to... We want to just know that there is a great benefit in praising God. And this should not be limited, church, please, just to a Sunday. If that's all you're doing, I tell you, you're not warring successfully. Praise the, the praise of God should always be on our lips. Yes, at home, in your car, yeah. just walking around, singing songs in the shower, praising God, invoking his presence, releasing his power. Amen. Very, very powerful, okay? So we're going to wrap up there. As I say, I had a little bit more for you, but um, thank you for your attention. Uh, there's a lot of word there, and uh, I hope it's helped you. We're just going to sing a song now as we finish. If anybody uh, wants prayer uh, for anything, uh, please come up to the front. We'd love to pray for, for you. Also, uh, if you're here today and uh, you don't yet know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and really you might have thought some of the things I've been talking about are a bit strange because we're talking about spiritual things, and they're, they're foreign to you. I could totally understand that. But uh, there is a God in heaven. He is true. We're not just accidents here on earth. And you're not an accident that you're just here today. God's drawn you and brought you here for a purpose because he loves you. And he wants to welcome you into his family. And he's offering today to accept you, to forgive all of your sins, everything you've ever done wrong, and to receive you just as you are. You don't have to improve yourself. He'll accept you just as you are. And then he's going to start to work in your life and bless you. And of course, at the end of your life, you'll know that you're going to heaven and to be with him forever. What an amazing thing. What an amazing gift. If you'd like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, to have your sins forgiven and become a part of God's family this morning, you can do so. I'd ask you, as we sing this song, as people stand and sing this song, you just come quietly to the front here and I'd love to pray with you. We're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to ask you to say anything. It's just a simple prayer between you and God and I can help you with that. Uh, also, as I say, if you have any other prayer needs, please come forward and we'd love to pray for you. Other than that, God bless you all. Let's just sing the song as we finish. Thank you, guys.